get started. I'm Kim Steggles from the Beaumont Parenting Program, and I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but Beaumont Parenting Program assists first-time parents that deliver at Beaumont, and we do it through education and support. And it's a volunteer-driven program. And if you'd like to know more about that afterwards, I'm happy to tell you more about that. But tonight we're going to talk about couples communication. Welcome. Come on in. We just started. Here's some handouts right here. We're going to talk about couples communication and certainly. And we're going to um, talk about scenarios and the way we communicate. And each one of us communicates in our own unique way. And we're going to talk about some of those um, nuances. But I'm Kim Staggles, and I have a co-presenter tonight. And I have a background in, um, I'm a limited license psychologist, and I did, prior to going to work at Beaumont, I did individual and family and marital work at a clinic and some private practice. And now I work full-time at Beaumont. So that's a little bit about me. And this is my co-presenter, Vicki, and I'm going to let her explain who she is. Hi, everybody. Um, as Kim said, my name is Vicki Palmer. I am a counseling intern. I have uh, one month from today. I'm officially done. Um, so I'll be a limited license uh, practicing count professional counselor. And um, I did part of my internship at Beaumont and worked with parents in a parenting group as well as postpartum. And my uh, full-time position is at Harrison High School in Farmington Hills. And I am the testing and career coordinator over at the school. But I'm really happy to be here and hopefully we'll give you lots of great information. Okay, okay. great, thanks. So would it be fair to say that we all communicate differently? <laughs> and we all bring our own unique style to the table. And would it be fair to say that sometimes we communicate with our partner and sometimes we do it non-verbally, maybe with a look or a gesture, and sometimes could, could we also think we're communicating with our partner and maybe our partner's not either hearing what we're saying or reading our mind? Would that be fair to say? <laughs> Many times when um, I had a couple in the office and I'd have one of the, uh, one of the partners say, my goodness, you should have known that I wanted you to do X, Y, or Z. And the other person would look at, at them and say, how was I supposed to know that? Well, you should just know that. You should know that I want this. Many times we think the other person can actually know what we're thinking, but that's not always the case. And we have to verbalize what our wants, needs, and um, what our, our hopes are. So tonight we're going to focus on um, the whole idea of the thoughts, feelings, versus basic needs. Now we all have our thoughts and feelings, and those are, they're kind of a vague kind of entity, and um, we all experience situations differently, so we may be feel a we experience the same situation, but our feelings towards a situation can be polar opposites. And feelings usually are on a continuum, and we can go from being angry to being sad to being joyous. And if you're a new parent, you kind of see this going like this, because hormones play a huge part in the way females communicate. And one minute we can be really happy and okay, and the next minute we can be kind of irritable and, and sassy. And so we see that a lot with postpartum moms. And sometimes if you're going through a huge struggle in life, you may also experience that. If you have a lot of stressors, if you have a lot of new events that are occurring, maybe you're, you're getting married and you're moving and you're starting a new job and all those things can cause you sometimes not to communicate the way you normally would and not to react to your partner like you typically would because you have these stressors and sometimes you overreact to situations. And of course we all have our wants. We'd all love to be wealthy, hit the mega million. Um, we'd all like to have a beautiful car and material things and status and power. And then I'm sure a lot of you folks have heard of Maslow's. Maslow's theory, you know, the Reese's monkey where the monkey was in the cage and um, they put him in with a soft 
blanket and that was supposed to emulate what his mother would be like and then they put the little monkey in just a cage with just chicken wire and he kind of was happier when he was in the little cage with the, the soft blanket. And so Maslow is a great theorist and he categorized our needs as food, shelter, water, and love. And love is a huge one. And we all need love. Some people think that, well, love is kind of ambiguous and maybe we are all not having this big desire to give love and express love and, and receive love. But that, that is a basic need. So when you kind of think about it in that way, it's very important. And with love comes your partner and communication. So that's what we're going to kind of focus on tonight. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. Great book. And I'm going to be referring to that a lot tonight. And Gary Chapman says that he's done various studies and he's found out that we receive love and give love in five different ways. And he calls them the five love languages. And we're going to go into each one of these and what these mean and how we kind of use these. And tonight you're probably going to go away thinking, wow, I never realized that this is how I'd like to receive love. And it's kind of eye-opening. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts. Um, I'm sorry. That's OK. <laughs> Acts of service and physical touch. Those are the basic love languages. And the first one is words of affirmation. And Vicki's going to talk about that. OK. Um, affirmations are compliments such as looking great in that dress. Um, it could be any number of things. You can think personally what you would like to hear. Um, some people want to get compliments about how they're dressed. Other people may find that offensive. So it's important to understand what your partner really wants to hear. Um, and then something as simple as just I really appreciate you changing Maggie's diaper. Um, you know, things like that. It just can be something simple where somebody is verbalizing something that you would like to hear. Um, and just conversely, um, how you express those words are quite important. You may be um, thinking it's about time you empty the dishwasher. But if you say that, is that person going to be prone to open, empty the dishwasher the next time? Right? You're, you're just, you haven't gotten anything positive from doing that. So your tendency would be to say, well, to heck with it then. She doesn't appreciate it. If he doesn't appreciate it, I'm not going to bother. You empty that dishwasher. So you may be thinking some of these things, but you can edit yourself. You, it's just really a matter of finding the filter. Um, thinking it's about time you, you empty the dishwasher, but you could say, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize that you were going to do that. Because you, you might be thinking something um, more negative, but if you catch yourself, it'll make the world of difference. Um, and they can be both um, positive in both context and tone. So if you, you may be saying something positive, like you look great in this dress, but if you have a, a nasty tone to your voice, expression on your face, and you're the least bit sarcastic, it's, it's just not going to be heard the way you want it to be. So it's, it's, it's important to be careful with that. And um, this expresses both the verbal appreciation um, and avoids complaints and, and some sort of negative feelings. And um, ask each of you to think about yourself now. Is this particular love language, the affirma affirmation, is important to you? Show of hands. Is this something that you need to hear or you don't? Okay, so yeah, just, yeah, about half. Um, and that's what's important about this, that you'll find with these five affirmations, you'll find that, yeah, oh, that, that suits me to a T. And something else you may say, well, it's not very important to me, but if it's important to your partner, then that's what you want to be able to express. Okay, the next, next love language is quality time. So now we all can think about how we spend time with each other. And when you think about this, is sitting in front of the TV with the TV on quality time? Is sitting <laughs> next to each other <laughs> reading um, 
the newspaper and not interacting with each other, is that quality time? It could be, it could be. <laughs> some, some folks could think so. And in some ways, some people can, can enjoy doing that. I, you know, when I think about quality time, I think about, and I'm not Jewish, but I think of the, the whole sitting shiva comes to mind. And when you think about when in the Jewish religion, when a person um, has a, a loss through death, uh, everyone kind of meets at someone's, the, the person's house who's lost the loved one, and they just sit, and they're just there, and not necessarily even have to you know, do a lot of talking. They're just, it's their presence. And when you think about being with your partner, isn't it great sometimes just to have them there? You don't necessarily even have to be like totally engaged all the time. Now, it, now I prefer the communication thing, but some people are just happy with just having their partner with them. Um, going out to dinner and talking about things that happened during the day and not necessarily always talking about your children. Who in this room have children? Okay, so everyone's a parent. So I knew this happened frequently when I was um, a young mother. My husband and I would sit there and what would we talk about the whole time we were on a date? Our children. Not that that was a bad thing, but all the other things that we probably should have talked about got kind of lost in the mix because we were just like all, just a mesh and just the children. And sometimes it's good to kind of talk about the other aspects of your life. And so to give your total attention, turn off that iPad, iPhone, turn off that TV, and no more distractions, just you and your partner, just be together and listen to each other. Listen with this open mind, have good eye contact, without interrupting. I know that I'm an interrupter. I'll be with my partner and he'll be talking and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. but wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> if I just <sighs> give myself time and let the poor guy talk, it's much better of an interaction than I am always trying to interject what I'm thinking or feeling. And so to really listen to the other person. And sometimes we have to do that in such a way that we have to almost paraphrase what they're saying to make sure that we've actually heard what the other person is saying. Because like I said at the beginning of the presentation, sometimes we filter things a lot differently. It's kind of like that game, um, the telephone game. You ever played that as a child? And like somebody starts off with saying something here, and by the time it gets to the last person, it's totally not what the first person said. Sometimes our own interpretations can just change the way we think we hurt our partner, and it can make or break a deal. So watching your body language, that is a huge one. How many times have we had a, a little conflict with our partner when we're sitting like this? <laughs> and maybe not even realizing it. In the 20-some years I worked in psych, I had to be totally, I worked in an inpatient psychiatric hospital, and you never wanted to approach someone like this. Because what is that telling them? That I'm totally closed off, my legs are crossed, my arms are crossed, don't even approach me. So I think it's important that when you're communicating with your partner that you're giving them even the body language of the openness that, yes, you're going to accept what they're saying, you're going to truly listen, you're going to engage with eye contact. And when you sit like this, it's kind of defensive. You're, you're giving your, your partner the idea that, okay, now I don't know how much I'm going to take in and agree with what you're saying because I'm kind of holding my ground here. So watch the body language. And Mr. Chapman suggests that each day we spend time with each other talking about events of the day and our feelings and really listening to what happened in our partner's day. And I know when I was a stay-at-home mom, I thought, oh, everything that happened at home was so dull and boring. But when my husband got home, he was interested in what the baby did or maybe what the neighbor said. And I'm thinking, wow, I just have nothing to contribute. But not true. Our partners are very engaged in listening if we just allow them to. OK, so now we're going to talk about um, receiving gifts. We don't always have to give each other material gifts. Think about when you were a child and you made your parent something in art class and you gave it to them. It wasn't like that the best prized possession they could ever receive as this like really wonderful gift that you made in art class. <laughs> 
So it's not necessarily important for us to have expensive things. Although, as a woman, I do like baubles, but <laughs> we don't have to get jewels all the time. Uh, I know when, when my kids were little, I'd write little notes and put it in their, in their lunch boxes. And every time they opened up their lunch box, they, they had a little note. And to them, that was like the greatest thing. So think about yourself. Do you like your partner to make you things? Do you like your partner to give you gifts? Do you like your partner to write little notes? Do you like your partner to bring you flowers, and not just when they're in trouble? <laughs> some people, that's their love language. They just thrive when they're receiving some kind of gift. And like I said, it doesn't have to be of material cost. It can be just something that they made, or, or flowers that they picked from their rose bush in the garden. So to me, that, that's think about it. Think about what your love language is. Tonight, we're going to try to identify each one of ours, but that could be a huge one for you. All right, I'm going to go over the fourth lang love language, which is the act of service. Um, and those are, those are things that you know your partner would like you to do. Um, you would be possibly cutting the grass, having dinner ready, simple things like that. And as we've talked about with all of these languages that we've, that we've discussed so far, they can be very simple. It's not anything that you have to make these big, grand gestures, plans that you are going away for a weekend together. Really simple can sometimes be the best thing. And uh, just like uh, Kim had discussed, um, those three things that you've done during the day, it's something that you do overtly where you actually, you know, you could even write them down. And instead of how you were sitting on the couch normally watching television, or each of you reading, you know, if you know that you usually go to bed at about 10 o'clock, 9.30, turn off everything and say, okay, let's have a nice talk. And it's not anything where you have to have any deep conversations that you're going that's going to keep you up at night, but just an opportunity to talk. Same kind of thing with this, doing these simple things that are important to your partner, which make them then important to you. Um, and with, as with other love language, you have to communicate to your partner, which is our theme for, for this um, workshop, is communication. And um, you, can, you can do that by speaking, by doing nice things for someone, by purchasing a gift. Another a gift I was thinking about, just like um, sometimes gifts are symbols, um, like at a wedding ceremony, something simple like that. When you have a new baby, some people get a special necklace, a birthstone, something to, um, as a keepsake for that wonderful occasion, things like that. And um, you can go ahead and be as creative as you want, but the, in, in my view, what's, what's most important and what Mr. Chapman talks about is, is communicating to your partner what it is that you want and giving your partner what it is that they want. Okay, and the fifth lane love language is the expression of uh, physical affection. Um, touching and physical affection can be a powerful tool in communicating your love for each other. Um, something simple as hugging, holding hands, rubbing their back. Again, it can be very simple. Um, and you need to discuss your primary love language with your partner to see what is most important to you. Um, and as it says here, um, discussing with your partner your two love languages you both have and speaking those love languages often, as often as possible. Um, and if it's something that, um, that you're not as comfortable with, um, this, this particular love language, that is something that you can express to your partner as well. Some people, I've seen you know, many programs on TV about that, about you know, this, you know, a hand holder heaven forbid is a hand holder. Some people just don't like that, especially out in public. Um, if that's something that you don't like, that's something that you, you can get across to your partner. And it doesn't have to be in a way that you're, you're you know, pulling your hand away saying don't do that. You know, just talk about that at another time when that person can hear you. We're moving into the absolutes, 
you, you know, I don't know if this is something that you've experienced where you are speaking this way to each other, especially starting it off with the word you, and oftentimes there's a finger attached to. <laughs> you never, you always, um, is that true? You never empty the dishwasher. No. <laughs> Could be. Probably never empty it often enough. <laughs> you know, you never get up with the baby in the middle of the night. So it's, it's a matter of, of choosing your words carefully. And if you say something that, that you um, realize maybe that was a little harsh, you can backtrack. You say you all have children. Have you done that with your children where you say something? Um, they, um, they're tugging at your leg while you're trying to make dinner or something. Would you stop? I'm trying to make dinner. And then you realize... Oops, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I'm sorry, honey. I'm just trying to make dinner. Can you go play for just a few minutes, and then we can talk. Something like that. You can backtrack with your partner as well. Um, the positive uh, communication includes those phrases that are open-ended. In other words, that they can't answer with a yes or a no. Um, especially if there's been some miscommunication that you've had in the past. If you start out. Uh, conversation with them where you have just a, a closed question, you probably will get no or yes, even though they could very well elaborate. But it's best to try and open up those lines of communication by having an open-ended question. We have um, two videos, um, just real short videos of um, examples of effective and as you can imagine, non-effective communication. Now this is a couple that's, that's having a brief conversation and we're going to identify what, if you think it's effective or non-effective. Go anywhere. All we do is work and take care of the kids. We never do anything fun. What are you talking about? I took you to the grocery store two nights ago. That's fun. We have to do that. That's a necessity. What else do you expect? All right, I'll just tell you what they're saying. She's saying to him, we never go out. All you ever do is work. All I ever do is work. I want to go out, I want to do something. You never take me out. And he's saying, what are you talking about? I just took you to the grocery store last night. What do you want from me? <laughs> Sound familiar, maybe? <laughs> like forever since we've done anything fun. Do you think we could go out this weekend without the kids? Well, our budget's a little low right now for the rest of the weekend, but we could probably go to Starbucks and I can get a set lunch for a setter. And maybe we can have a date on Saturday. That sounds perfect. Let's do that. Now, obviously, obviously the, couples, the couple looked a lot happier. <laughs> so I think it's very easy to identify which was the effective and which was the non-effective communication. And did you hear any absolutes in the second conversation? And even though he wasn't saying, well, he wasn't totally jumping on the bandwagon, he was saying, yes, we can do this, but he did put some qualifiers in that. And that's okay, it's all right to say, you know what, I'd love to go out with you, I wanna go out with you, we can't afford a lot this weekend, maybe we just have to, go and get a quick coffee somewhere. Or maybe we have to just go to a fast food place and I'll get the babysitter. Now how many times uh -huh. <laughs> has our partner done that? That is the key. And many times gentlemen, men don't realize that women would love for their partner to set up the babysitter. And that would be like even better sometimes than actually where you go. If your husband set up the whole scenario, if they surprise you, set up the babysitter, set up the plans, and you had to do nothing but show up and maybe have your hair done. <laughs> yeah. So now that we've kind of explained the love languages, do you feel like you can identify what these are? And do you think you can identify what your partner? Um, I'm just going to tell you a quick little story. I'm widowed and I'm going to be getting remarried soon. And every single time I go to, with my fiance, to Somerset and we go on that moving stairs, 
we have an argument. And every single time we're in an airport and we go on those moving, you know those moving uh, walkways? Sidewalk. Yes. We have an argument. So finally, last week, we went on those, went to Somerset, went on that moving sidewalk, sidewalk <laughs> and we started an argument. And we never argue. And I, the next day I looked at him and I said, what is it about those moving sidewalks that make us argue? And he said, well, I think that you like to like cuddle up to me and do public displays of affection. And I'm not that kind of person. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I said, I bet I know what your love language is. I said, I bet your love language is just for your partner just to be there. Not necessarily even to super engage, but just be there. Just spend time, just be hanging out together. He goes, absolutely. And I said, my love language is affection. So how can we work this out so when we go in public that you don't feel like I'm hanging on you and blocking the way for the walkway? Because, of course, as a, a not overgeneralized, but as a guy, sometimes guys look at the picture like, well, I'm blocking the, it's not, it's not being efficient by blocking mm -hmm. the walkway, by standing next to each other. <laughs> It's not being polite. And I'm like, I don't care about other people. I'm just going to hook on to him. <laughs> and at that moment, like a light bulb went off for us both. And we said, wow, we would have, if we would have really looked at that picture, because that little argument started like here. And before we knew it, we had escalated to this huge argument in the middle of Somerset. And it was all about the moving stairs and how we were walking on the moving stairs. <laughs> so think about some recent disagreements you've had recently. Was there miscommunication? Was one of you expecting something and not getting it? Was one of you projecting something? Was it totally miscommunication or misunderstanding? And what is your love language? Now that you've heard these love languages, is there any one that you need more clarification on? Is there any one, that, any one of those that you'd like to discuss more? Can you have more than one? Yes. <coughs> Typically, there's one that kind of shines though for you, the, like the primary one. But, I mean, I love gifts. I love being affectionate. I love people spending time with me. But I think if I was just going to hone in on one, it would probably be affection for me. So think about it for yourself. And when you say affection, you the physical touch. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yes. And then think about what you imagine your partners to be. And you don't have to do it here, but tonight when you go home, Talk to your partner about it and see if you figured out what the other person would say, what their love language is. And if I can interject too, as, as Kim was describing, um, she utilized um, a disagreement to, to actually have a conversation and figure that out because sometimes that can be what you find that you are, might be quarreling about over and over again is the same theme. So that must be something that somebody, one of the two of you needs and is not getting. Um, so it, it might be interesting to kind of think about it. Think like the last five times you had words uh, between each other, what was it about? And maybe you'll see that it has to do with, you know, he doesn't get me anything. He never does anything for me. She is always saying this. She's never saying that. Those kinds of things. Is it is it more of the act of service where you feel like um, it's it's something that uh, it's a it's it's doing, or is it something where it's, um, it's the spending quality time together? I think a lot of people. It, does everybody work too outside of the home? I don't. Okay. Do you find because so, sometimes that can be a problem too because you're home with the baby all the time. A lot of times, that's what I find, is that that's, that's something that bothers a lot of people. Um, you know, one person may want to go out more often than the other person. And really, when you think about it, um, what made you so mad on a Monday, you might not even remember what it was on a Wednesday. But it repeats itself on Friday, because it's that same love language that isn't being addressed. So. Um, the conversations we're having, the, um, the handouts that you have, you might find that um, the book uh, by, uh, I think it's Dr. Chapman actually. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, he, it might be something that you really like 
to read and it's something that you can sit down and discuss it. It's, it can be something that you're doing for quality time together instead of watching something on television. And um, encourage you to do that. The other um, really good way to think about relationships is, I don't know if you've heard of this book, Getting the Love You Want, um, A Guide for Couples. And that one is written by um, Dr. Harvey Harville Hendricks. And that whole, he buys into the imago therapy. And I don't know if you're familiar with what imago therapy is. But imago therapy is, is something that I don't necessarily buy into. But I like the whole idea that we tend to pick partners that are similar to someone from our childhood. And in doing that, we have the same actual characters, if you will, but a different script. And we think, well, this time it's going to be different because this time we have a different person that we're dealing with. But when you really dig down deep, that person may have many qualities that your mother or father or grandparents, whoever raised you, had, whoever your primary caregivers were. And those qualities you weren't even conscious of, nor were they, but they're very, very similar. And maybe it's a combination of a few qualities, but they kind of, in some ways, remind you of that parent. And maybe that was the parent that you struggled with. And so you're kind of using the same kind of dialogue with that person that you'd use with the parent that you struggled with. So it's, I kind of think of it as different characters, same script. But it's a great book, and you don't have to necessarily buy into the imago therapy. You can just glean so much from understanding that whole, the way we react, and we tend to, as Vicki said, use that reaction over and over again. We tend to frequently respond where I'm on the walkway and he's telling me to move to the side, and I'm getting angry and saying, I don't want to move to the side. Don't tell me to move to the side. And <laughs> That kind of reaction creates something in him, and it creates something in me, and we didn't even realize what we were really arguing about in the first place. It really had nothing to do with the fact that we were on this walkway. It had to do with the fact that he doesn't like public displays of affection, and I crave lots of affection. And when he told me to move to the side, he reminded me of how my mother used to scold me. And so <laughs> it's kind of like looking at those incidents and kind of picking away at it and saying, why is this feeling so similar? Why is this feeling so familiar? And that brings us um, to um, the attachment theory, couples communication and dynamics. Um, as Kim was describing, um, there's the emotional connection that children form with their parent or primary caregiver. Um, and as we all know, if you're parents, you know how much that, how the healthy attachment, attachment depends on that. And it's something that you carry throughout your life. Um, this is something that um, you really have to do a little bit of thinking about, though. Um, it's not something that's necessarily just going to come to you, oh, I know why I feel this way because of something that happened in my childhood. Just, it just might just be that just the attachment, the communication that you had, but you, you need to really kind of think about it carefully when something is happening, why do I feel like that? Somebody can't tell you that, especially some of these things that you might not have thought about for 10 or 15 years, and you know, some people would say this is more um, like a Freudian kind of theory, you know, that everything from our childhood, um, but I think everybody, all of us, share in that we all have memories of things that happen when we're younger, and these attachments that you that you have with other people, these caregivers that you have, carry over into your to your partnerships that you have. So it's something to help you understand why you may be struggling, and see if that doesn't help kind of resolve some of the differences that you might be having. And uh, here are some examples of some unhealthy attachment patterns. Um, a disorganized parent would be somebody who's very inconsistent with their children, um, whether it's um, sometimes they're allowed to jump on the bed, sometimes they're allowed to hold your keys for you, and other times you might say, you know, go sit in timeout. I told you not to take and touch my keys. 
that's very confusing for them. They just don't understand why, why is that? Or you say, um, you know, you can't, you can't play with the Legos because you were throwing them at your sister. Um, and then you get the Legos and hand them to them. And then you wonder why the next time you tell them no for something that they throw a fit because you actually, you actually punished them, actually told them, no, you can't have it. It's just very confusing for them. So when I hear that word disorganized, I just think of confusion and what that must be like, especially for a little one. And um, this may result in the child becoming the caregiver, a caregiver at an early age. And parents that are not emotionally engaged or have difficulty regulating their, their own emotions can then raise a child who is having those same difficulties. And you'll see them in your children's classrooms. You may see children like that at a park um, where, in, in a mall, as Kim described, where there, there's those play areas um, and you see a child that is just acting just out of control. Um, and they can even be super, super silly. Same thing, it still causes a lot of confusion for other people that are trying to deal with this child. And then healthy attachments. You want to go ahead? Sure. And hopefully we could all understand healthy attachments and we've hopefully had the, um, we've been lucky enough to have this. This is when the adult that is caring for you really is consistent, is, you know, you can depend on them and as a result you become feeling like you are not dependent on anyone else. You feel independent as adults. You feel like, okay, I'm not going to be able to, um, many children who struggle with this feel like, okay, mother is going to be present this time, but maybe not next time. Well, in the healthy attachment patterns, because mother is always present and always there to tend to your needs, you have the, the wherewithal to think, okay, you know, in relationships, my partner is going to be there when I need them. And, but I don't need to have them there all the time to feel whole and to feel secure because I know that I'm an independent person. And so these attachments that we build in childhood and the way our caregivers attend to us really make or break who we are as adults. And like Vicki said, we're not, we don't want to blame everything on our childhood. It's not that we want to say, well, because I had a difficult childhood, I can't be a secure human being. We're not trying to insinuate that, but there, are, there is validity to the fact that in research has shown that children that are raised in an environment where there is very insecure attachment parenting, that they struggle with feeling independent and strong and secure with who they are. And then um, the next thing that we wanted to talk about is the huge bridge from going from here you are as a couple, and this is great, and this is wonderful, and then you become parents, mm -hmm. and what a challenge that is, and how sometimes the playing field becomes uneven, and sometimes one party feels like they're doing all the taking care of the baby, or they're doing all the chores in the house, or they're doing all the errands, and the other person isn't carrying their weight, and then many times what happens is resentment builds up, and um, irritability and sometimes we're not even conscious of that sometimes we just like keep it I call it brown stamping where we just hold on to it and then a little thing happens and poof, it opens the huge volcano and all this other stuff starts spewing out and like you never take care of the kids and you never change a diaper and I always have to run the children to soccer and you never take out the garbage and you never empty the dishwasher and I'm always doing the laundry and all these things start bubbling out when there's one little thing that you are really angry about <laughs> but because you've held on to all these things it just escalates so after we have children so much changes in our life and sometimes I think we forget to nurture who we are as a couple who in this room has had a date night in the last three months Good job. Okay, guys, you've got to have a date. You've got to nurture this loving relationship that created these wonderful, beautiful children. But it's important to 
have time alone. It's important to speak to your love languages. It's important to connect with each other. Because our work schedule, if you have a little one that doesn't sleep, and you're constantly being sleep deprived. During um, World War II, sleep deprivation was a form of torture. So when you think about it that way, in essence, we're kind of being tortured, not intentionally by our children, by our children, but that's what's happening. So you have sleep deprivation, your time together is maybe this much, and the chores, chores are building, and the to-do list builds and builds and builds, and your time shrinks and shrinks. So you forget about the whole couple thing. You forget about nurturing this whole thing as the, what created this beautiful, wonderful environment of these two people in love created this child. And I think many times when I'd have couples in my room, I'd say, go back to the time when you were dating. What was that like? What did that feel like? What did that stir in you? Kind of recreate that if you can. Get back to what that was like, where everything was fun and new and, and the bills weren't up here and the chores weren't up here. And get back to just enjoying each other's company and kind of put those other things over here for maybe a Saturday until you can start nurturing each other a little bit. Usually this is um, the time when, and I, I, I have to tell you, I didn't, I didn't bring the paper plates. And you can do this at home easily. But you take a paper plate, and the circle is supposed to be your life. And you do this little pie thing. And you do your life before you had children, and what was that like? And so you section off the pie by saying, OK, this, is, this part of the pie was my work time. This part of the pie was my relationship time. This part of the pie was fun. Who in the last month has had me time in this group? Me time is equally important. Because we are like pitchers of water. If we keep on pouring out and not replenishing, there's not going to be anything left. And it's very hard to give to the other person when we're not filling up our pitcher. So me time, couple time, and family time are all very important. And it's important to constantly remember that we have to have at least 15 minutes a day to ourselves to do something to rejuvenate ourselves, even if it's just taking a hot shower, whatever it is that makes us feel good. So in the pie, you're supposed to do pre-children and then the time now where you have children and what that's like for you. And make that comparison with each other and look at and how you both kind of perceive what your lives are like. And you're going to be surprised when you look at that pie and you see how much time is actually spent engaging with the other person. And actually speaking to each other's love language. And then it's also, I can just share a story too. I have um, one of my dearest friends. She's um, about to have her son graduate from high school. And he is going to be going away to school. So there, it's her and her husband. And it's occurring to her, oh my god. Um, what are we going to talk about? Because he was in sports and music and just social activities. They were, everything was focused on, on their child. And now it's all of a sudden, she not only is going through a transition, you know, saying goodbye to her son as he goes away to school, but now she's also trying to decide how that's going to work with her, her and her husband. And um, she's just like afraid, she's like a, a scared, a scared child who's afraid to move too much and make any rash decisions. Um, but we were talking, we walk in the park, and, and we were talking about it, and it's just what Kim said, going back to the way things were, because you were so busy, however many years that, that was. Some people that have had two and three children, it can be 25 years by the time you, you have your house to yourselves again. Um, but that's a long time to be busy doing all of those activities, going here, there, and everywhere. So you do, you go back to the way it, way it was in your mind, try and remember what it was, and do some of those things that you did before, and a lot of those feelings become, be, are rekindled. Okay. No 
secret that um, a lot of couples, once they become empty nesters, divorce. Because they're like, I don't even know him anymore. I don't know her anymore. How can you avoid that? That's a good question. A long so, way. Yes. Like, I understand trying to think back once the child is moving out, but like, along the way. Well, yeah, because you're you're saying what she realized she should have been doing years before. It's like all of a sudden it was she was just hit with that realization. Oh boy! I have so. a friend right now whose child is leaving for college, and she's scared to death mm -hmm. to be with her husband. Like <laughs> she's like, what are we? Who are we? And here's similar things like when people retire. When right. one person's been retired and the other person is retired too, and now right. they're Retirement home all day together. Right. Yeah, so, um, and then I have another friend who, um, they did divorce, and they're taking down. Like, they're like, I don't even know that person. So it's that keeping that communication, knowing that person through that child's lifetime. So constantly getting to connect, to reconnected with your partner, and making sure you set up those dates, and making sure that when you do have time alone that you are reconnecting and that one person isn't reading their Kindle and the other person isn't, um, you know, watching TV. That when you do have that quality time together, that it becomes quality time. That it's just not quantity time, but not quality time. So you're constantly nurturing your relationship. You're constantly checking in with each other. You're constantly talking about the tough issues instead of waiting till the end until you brown stamp so much that that one thing. Or you say, I don't know this person. This person, what happened in the last 25 years? They've become a totally different person. They weren't the same person I married 25 years ago. Even something simple like um, a lot of people like to go to movies together. Well, instead of one person just deciding, you say, what do you think? Did you hear about that movie? Talking about the movie. Instead of, you know, if, if there's a movie that you want to go see and it's, to you, it's like, the worst thing you could ever suggest. We've heard about that. <laughs> there's death and dismemberment, and it's one of those kinds of things. So or it's a, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Instead exactly. of a chick flick, right? <laughs> you know. I'm not, no, I'm not that. But no, I'm not that either. Exactly, but that's the kind of thing, though, where you talk about that and you say, well, what's it about? And maybe you decide, okay, I'll go to that one this time, but can I pick the next time? and then talk about the movie afterwards instead of just going home. You know, take a few minutes, sit in the theater for a little while, go sit outside now the weather's getting nice. It's a matter of just extending what normally is happening and just shifting gears sometimes where you just mix things up, where you, you, you know, always do something on a, on a Saturday. Um, let's go out on Friday. You know, I'm normally tired. Yeah, but I, let's just do something different for a change. Just, and like I said, something like simple, like going for a walk in the park. Um, and holding hands. Yeah. <laughs> While you're walking. Mm -hmm. But not on the, not on the not sidewalk. On the side. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> That's a good question, though. Yeah, it's very good. Did that, did that answer your question? So trust and honesty is definitely the cornerstone of all loving, close relationships. And when a, a person has engaged in any kind of um, activity outside the marriage, be it you know an emotional attachment to another person or a physical attachment, it can cause huge mistrust in the relationship. And as time goes on, that can be very problematic. And that's what's in, when it's very important to seek outside help. And um, if you are worried that your partner may be having some kind of um, suspicious activities, instead of saying, you're having an affair, aren't you? Or you're gambling or whatever. Instead of approaching it as accusatory, ask the question in a way that is very non-accusatory. And saying, you know what, I'm worried. Your behavior's changed. This is not how you typically behave. You're, you're working late every night. This is not what it used to be like. Can you tell me what's going on? Can you, I'm scared, I'm worried, I'm uncertain. Can you share with me what's happened that's making this all different? 
And and I was just going to say that that to me is the most important part, which you said at the end, that I'm scared. You know, I'm worried. That kind of thing. Then you, you're speaking with emotions versus anger. And the other person will, will sense that it's not being accusatory. And it's our delivery. Our delivery can make or break something, definitely. Instead of saying, I know you were out last night with the guys and at the, 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 the bar. Instead of saying, I, I was worried about you. You didn't come home till late. I was scared. I didn't know what happened. The, the calls I made weren't answered. Tell me what was going on. Tell me why I couldn't reach you. Mm -hmm. Much better delivery. Wow. And so that definitely changes it from being judgmental and not accusatory to let's understand what's going on here. And as we said at the beginning of this, this portion, the trust being the cornerstone, if the trust is shaken, everything else is kind of discolored at that point, where you normally saw blue, there's some mistrust, something happens, even if it's something simple like um, a $20 bill that you, you had in your wallet. You go to pay for gas and the bill is gone. And you say, oh yeah, I, I need some money. Well, thanks a lot. That to me is also something that can be considered mistrust because you can't, you don't know that you're going to have, whether it's money or time or feelings, those things, something, it feels like something that's being taken away from you. So it's those kinds of situations where you can just talk about that, say, next time I need you to tell me so I don't find myself standing at the gas pump with a penny to my name. <laughs> Things like that. Yep. All right, that's it. That's the end. Well, thank you, folks. Do you have any, any questions, anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? Um, oh, just, he does. <laughs> I just need to make an, like an observation from going and hearing Dr. Chapman speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I heard it during this talk, but I mean, there's just a short period of time, obviously, you can't cover everything. I think generally we're predisposed to love um, our partner in the way that we like to receive love. And oftentimes, opposites attract. So I think it's kind of, we sort of talk about that idea that you have to figure out what your partner's love language is. And love language that way. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and that is essential. Thank you. That's, that's a great summation. And many times we think we know what their love language is. We definitely know ours, or we think we do, and sometimes we have to spend a little time digging at it. And then when we communicate with our partner, well, this is what I really like, and this is my love language. This is how I like to receive love. And what is your love language? And connecting that and, and then actually following through. And I, and I gave you a handout with some suggestions, and hopefully those will be helpful and you'll engage in some of those when speaking to your love languages or your partners. And then really it's what it really comes down to is something so, so simple that we all learned when we were younger, or were taught when we were young, younger at least, and what we're probably teaching our children is you treat somebody like you want to be treated. And you can't expect, you can't expect to get something positive in return when you're not giving something positive. And just communicate, um, communicate, communicate. My <laughs> question that I think has um, helped us is uh, asking each other, "Am I, am I loving you well? Mm -hmm. Do you feel I'm loving you well?" Right. Check again. Definitely. And it's like it really gets you both to think. About mm -hmm. it. Yes. Or ask yourself, "Am I loving him well?" Right. And no, that's beautiful. That is. I, that's it's gorgeous. Yes. And it really I like is. That. It's beautiful. Thank no, you. It really is. Thank you. Is that something that you can, you yeah, have just those few words just going through your head, and it can stop you maybe when you would normally be upset about something. It can stop you thinking, oh, I'm not loving well if, I'm, if I say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And humor, having humor um, yeah. within our relationships can be just vital. And sometimes, I know I'm guilty of this, I become so serious that I forget the funny part. I mean, if someone walked by and saw us arguing on this moving walkway, they probably were laughing hysterically seeing two grown adults arguing about this 
<laughs> moving walkway. But <laughs> later I was able to laugh about it, but at the time I was so angry about this. <laughs> so finding the humor is, is also very important. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out tonight, folks. Thank you.